there, we only have 150 people at our events. Right. Um, we don't need 10,000, 5,000, 1,000, whatever um, to, to be not only, you know, successful, but very, very, very profitable. So mm-hmm. um, it's, it's, I, I, I kind of look at it almost from a networking perspective. It's, you know, it doesn't matter how many friends you can count. It matters how many friends you can count on. This is the Interchange Maker with Jay Wong, the podcast dedicated to purpose driven entrepreneurs and multi passionate individuals. Tune in each week as we bring you an inspiring person and message to help you activate and tap into your inner change maker. Thanks for spending some time with us today, and let's get started. Hello, hello, everyone, my dear change makers. I hope everyone is having a stellar week. Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible.com. You guys could get a free audiobook download and a 30 day free trial at www.audibletrial.com backslash change maker. They have over 180,000 titles to choose from for your phone, Android, MP3 player, Kindle. Uh, what have you. I figured we always mention so many resources and books in these episodes so you guys could feel free to check out the previous episodes and in the show notes where we actually list out all the books and the links. You guys could find that at www.theinnerchangemaker.com. And in this one, we have some stellar book recommendation as always. So be sure to listen all the way through till the end to get all the goodies. To download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com dot com backslash changemaker. Again, that's audibletrial.com backslash changemaker for your free audiobook. Now, if you are a first-time listener, welcome to the show. This is the place dedicated to purpose-driven individuals and passionate creators trying to help people, um, motivate them, inspire them to be real, be themselves, and you know, put some content out there. Put be a little more vulnerable into the world. It is 2015 after all. So uh, thank you for those who have uh, wrote in recently giving me feedback on the show. I really do appreciate that. If you guys you know, have any suggestions on the format of the show, um, whether you want more interviews, more solo episodes, uh, what type of future guests, maybe sponsors, you guys can reach out to me via Twitter at the J Wong or email me directly uh, my name, J-A-Y, at thejwong.com. I'll definitely try to incorporate it and just trying to get a sense of what kind of show that you, the listener, want. I really am really grateful for the show because it gives me the chance to interview people I really look up to and it gives them a platform to share their story to the world. This week, we have the legendary Jason Gaynard on the show. Jason is the creator and founder of Mastermind Talks, one of the most exclusive entrepreneurial events in the space, with speakers and guests such as Guy Kawasaki, Tim Ferriss, uh, Cameron Harold, James Altinger, and many more prominent names actively impacting our world. He is also an accomplished author and host of a highly rated podcast as well. He has quite the story about, you know, not giving up and betting everything on relationships. And in this episode, Jason shares with us his story of going from making 22 times the national average income to being over a quarter million dollars in cash debt. Actually, in the interview, he shares that he was a bit over that amount. So that's pretty crazy. He went from over a quarter million dollars in cash debt to creating his first mastermind talks, which previously mentioned is one of the most exclusive events. Their tagline is that if you are the smartest person in the room, then you're in the wrong room. So you got to love that. Earlier this year, uh, entrepreneur.com wrote an amazing article on him. It, It was entitled how this entrepreneur went from dead broke to mega influencer in one year. So I really recommend you guys check out that article. Um, go download his book. He shares like a torrent for his book in, in the interview. Um, his podcast, uh, MMT, his Facebook community, because honestly, Jason is one of the most authentic human beings I've come across, and it's so great to see him rise to fame, per se. So to give you all a bit of context, uh, I met Jason right before he hit his so-called 
rock bottom and became this super connector. And and so this was not really as formal of an interview, but it was more of just catching up and being able to ask him all the questions I've always wondered. And so this will direct cut directly into our conversation. And I really hope you guys look into his story, listen to the lessons that he gives in this conversation because everyone, creator, entrepreneur, employee, whoever you are, Everyone can learn something from him. So here we go. Without any further ado, here is the episode with Jason Gaynard. Mastermind Talks, our first event was May 2013. Um, So I'm actually in my emails. Uh, You know what? You're right. 2012 was when we connected. (laughs) (laughs) June 26, 2012. So um, at that time, I had no, like, dude, I, I was just getting out of my last business and that was... And that's when I landed a quarter million dollars in debt in August. So I connected with you right before <laughs> I hit my rock bottom. So I didn't realize oh, wow. it was that long. I thought you I thought you connected like after my first Mastermind Talks event, but you connected way before Mastermind Talks was on my radar. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, you know, to be funny, it's like I remember, you know, we were talking about like your old business. I had obviously no idea that, you know, you were in that situation. I know... I think in one of your last episodes, you went into like almost like excruciating detail and almost (laughs) like, you know, what was going on in that situation. Um, Did you want to maybe, you know, give the audience, maybe people that are not familiar with your story, maybe give them kind of just like a two minute, not that it could be explained really in two minutes, but, you know, give them a condensed version of how did you end up a quarter million in cash debt and, and how was that situation? Yeah. Um, so I really, really quickly, I, I mean, I dropped out of high school. I just wasn't much of an academic um, and didn't follow, you know, conventional rules. Um, and uh, I right out of high school, I, I started a service-based business, which was actually a concierge firm. So we'd run errands for people. And I realized that a service-based business can be very hard to scale. So I uh, pivoted to an online product business, which I grew to about $6 million a year over four years, which was a ticketing business. So we sold and resold concert tickets and sporting event tickets uh, in Canada. And that business grew real quick. I mean, in, in, in those four years, that's how we, we, we got to about six, seven million with a small team. Um, and uh, I was living my model of success, which was the whole four hour work week at the time, which was traveling the world. I was making a ton of money. Sure. Uh, yeah. With all that money and all that free time, I started to ask myself some questions like, well, why am I here? And will I be remembered? Um, and how many people show up to my funeral? And you start climbing up Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And I just wasn't happy with the answers I was giving myself. And around that time, I was probably around 25, 26, I guess. Um, consciously, I decided to sell my business. Uh, subconsciously, I started to just detach from it because uh, I just I didn't want anything to do with it. I didn't have a great team. Um, I didn't do any Colby tests or <laughs> Colby scores on these people <laughs> in hiring. So I didn't have great hiring processes. So I hired you know B level players, which in turn hired C level players, and it was just right. it was not good, not good from a culture perspective. Uh, and I hated the industry. I despised the industry. Uh, the the ticket selling, the or ticket, reselling. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah, like most entrepreneurs, you're told to pick a business based on opportunity and proximity, right? Right. How can you make the most amount of money almost le- almost as effortlessly as possible? Sure. Um, and there's usually no passion talk or, or anything, you know, related to that involved in that initial conversation. So that's what I did. Uh, my mentors at the time were very financially successful and very financially driven. Um, so that was my model of success. And uh, because of that, I made a lot of sacrifices to, to make a lot of money. And then when I got there, I realized it wasn't what I thought it would be. So, um, and g- given the, the, the type of business it was and, um, and stuff like that, I couldn't sell the business easily without me being a part of, um, you know, that onboarding process with the new owner. So regardless if I sold the business, I'd still have to be a part of the business for like six months to a year which I was done. I didn't want anything to do with it. So decided to scale it down to zero, was comfortable with the with the idea. I'm like, if I scale it to zero, I'll have a little bit of money left in the bank and I'll be able to start something new and have a little bit of a runway. Well, two things happened that were beyond my control. Um, I guess would be May, probably like June, July, I'd say, of 2012. Yeah. Um, so that by August, when the dust settled, I was a quarter million dollars in debt. 
Um, so one was I had a merchant services processor that eliminated my cash flow overnight, which put me in a hell of a spot when I had 20, 20 something employees and two retail stores and stuff like that. And another one was, um, I just put all my eggs in one basket when it came to, um, uh, a, like a, a line of credit. Um, and basically they, they put our line of credit on hold at one point in time for no reason, which kept us from buying more inventory and we couldn't kind of feed this machine anymore. So, um, yeah, both of those just came, <laughs> turned out to be like the perfect storm. Those two plus me being disconnected from the business and not wanting anything to do with it yeah. was just the, yeah, the perfect storm and was the nail in the coffin. So, um, yeah, August, 2012 was when I quote unquote hit rock bottom. And then, uh, mastermind talks kind of came out of that purely by a strike of, of chance. Um, I had never had the inclination of ever doing an event or being in the event space or anything remotely close to that. But somebody on Facebook who was like not even a super close friend, but posted that they had an extra ticket to go see Seth Godin in New York. And um, I've always been a huge fan of Seth's, but I've never had an opportunity to actually see him speak live in person. So I decided to, to take the ticket. I had no other obligations at the time. And I uh, didn't know what it was about, but I went down there uh, or, yeah, down to New York and um, turned out it was about the connection economy and how there's huge value connecting like-minded individuals. And at the time, yeah. I'm like, to me, there's no group as disconnected as entrepreneurs because everybody's working in their own little businesses. So I uh, started these things called mastermind dinners where I'd invite six to eight entrepreneurs who didn't know each other and would facilitate connecting them over dinner. First one I did. I almost canceled two hours prior because I'm like, nobody's going to see, nobody's going to see value in this. They think I'm going to, they're going to think I completely wasted their time. Uh, but thankfully it was like two hours to, do, the, to dinner time. So I couldn't cancel just out of integrity. I just didn't want to do that to people. Right, so, right, right. Uh, ended up doing it and it turned out to be a huge success. And I just got clarity that connecting entrepreneurs was something I want to do to some capacity, um, for the rest of my life and not necessarily as a, as a business, uh, because I wasn't monetizing these dinners. I was actually paying for them out of pocket. Um, but my reasoning at the time was that the bank could take my car, they could take whatever measly assets I have left, but they couldn't take my relationships. Investing in the relationships was the safest investment I, I could make at the time. And uh, I believe it's the same really for anybody. So that's, that's um, really interesting though. I mean, you, I know it's, it's, it's such a fascinating story. You know, a lot of people, I mean, you know, once again, debt is probably, you know, all about perspective, right? If you've never been in debt, maybe <laughs> 10 grand, 20 grand of debt, maybe that's a lot. I think to a lot of people, whether they're entrepreneurs or not, um, quarter million just sounds very, you know, intimidating, very daunting. Um, how did you like make that decision at that time to, you know, kind of, you know, knowing that relationships would be kind of the one thing to invest in or these dinners would be something that would, you know, pay out because there wasn't necessarily like, you know, uh, a return per dinner, you know, if you look at it like that. Yeah, no, I, I, I honestly, I don't know what kind of pushed me over the edge because I wasn't a networker. I wasn't, I mean, I'm not, you know, traditionally like an extrovert in, in social settings and, and stuff like that. Well, the one thing that happened a year prior, which did shift my mindset a little bit was I went to an event that Tim Ferriss put on. Um, it was called Opening the Kimono, which was geared towards people who want to become New York Times bestselling authors. And I never had the intention of ever writing a book or being an author, author or any of that kind of stuff. But I'm like, I, I did my self-talk was that, you know, at $10,000, it was $10,000 for two days. And I'm like, at $10,000, there's bound to be some interesting people there. Um, and that's where I met. That's where I became friends with, with Tim and guys like Ryan Holiday and Tucker Max mm. and Lewis Howes and Evan Pagan and yeah. um, all these just amazing, amazing guys. And, and it just really kind of shifted my mindset on, um, you know, surrounding yourself with other brilliant people. And um, that five, that $10,000 investment was just, I mean, it's it's paid paid for itself like you know i don't know a hundredfold now yeah um, yeah and uh it's uh so that probably put me on that that path on to some degree as far as valuing relationships and then like i said i mean i was i was really close to just turning it all in and be like yeah i have no money left take whatever <laughs> take whatever assets i have which sure. is nothing <laughs> um, so I, I, and I don't, I couldn't like, I didn't want to do like a big withdrawal out of the bank account. Cause then, you know, they could come after me and sue me for, for, uh, you know, sitting on cash when I have debts and stuff like that. Right. So I literally just spent the rest of it <laughs> on these dinners Yeah, uh, because I'm like, again, like they can't take, they can't take these relationships. They can't take 
there's two things they can't take. One is me investing in myself. That's the safest investment I can make and also relationships. So I actually joined, and I think you know Joe Polish. I joined, joined Joe Polish's 25K group um, that year. Um, and the rest of the money I pulled into those dinners. Wow. Wow. Because I, I just think it's it's really, I'm sure you've gotten this a lot, you know, over the last, you know, three, four years as you've kind of told the story over and over again. Um, just because I, I think a lot of people, you know, it's it's like when you're in that situation, it's kind of this like fight or flight mode kind of kicks in. Um, and, you know, to make those types of investments, uh, especially at, you know, such high price points in yourself, in your relationships, um, I mean, definitely shows, you know, kind of the, the character and, and definitely adds to your story and who you are as a person. Um, curious though, how did you, I, I know you went to the, the Seth Godin event and, you know, he was talking about the connection economy. Um, was that, did, were other people doing dinners similar to that type of format in terms of bringing entrepreneurs together? What was the, the inspiration, um, I guess, behind just the first one? Yeah, so it's, it's funny. So, I mean, the people that that went to that particular event, um, and oftentimes the people that show up at Seth's events aren't uh, all like you know great entrepreneurs. Uh, there's there's a lot of aspiring entrepreneurs, and just the the audience he speaks to. Sure. Uh, however, he shared one story, and and this is the story that was a catalyst for everything. Um, was I forget the the gentleman's name, but he shared this story about a guy who was um, head of business development for an IT firm. Uh, I don't know, remember how long ago is it, but it was, but basically he was head of uh, business development for this new company. And he knew that if he could, uh, he, he wants to target 500 people, specifically 500, like the Fortune 500 CIO. CIOs were the decision makers for yeah. IT. So he, what he did was he knew that if he got a lot of these CIOs to do business with them, they would be like the 800 pound gorilla in their, their industry. So he was very kind of hyper targeting those, those 500 people. And what he did was he realized what, what clusters of cities they were based out of. And he would fly to a city and he'd say, Hey, He'd email them and say, you know, I'm doing a breakfast with other CIOs, uh, you know, from Texaco and Coca-Cola and all this kind of stuff. Would you be interested in coming? There was no sales pitch or anything. It was just the core purpose of it was to connect these CIOs because they're they're rarely connected. Hmm. And what he would do is when they would have this breakfast, inevitably these CIOs would talk about business issues they're facing, right? Of course, Most of the time yeah. they're, they're IT related. Sure. So he would just sit there and naturally they would turn to him and be like, hey, can you guys fix this? Uh, and he would just, you know, take notes and then he'd loop back with them afterwards. Um, and you know, if nef no business came from it, it didn't come. But at the end of the day, he was always top of mind because he delivered so much value by doing these breakfasts. Um, and that's how I, that's kind of gave me the idea of these dinners on, on some level. And, um, I kind of ran with it and then I had an opportunity to do an event with Tim Ferriss, which to me, I had, it was, I saw it as a chance to do what I do in these dinners, but on a larger scale. So instead of having, you know, six to eight people, I could have a hundred people. So that's how mastermind talks came to be in mm -hmm. essence. Yeah. But ever since then, I've, I've come across a few friends of mine, um, who started dinners before me or around the same times uh, as me. And they have incredible networks like Dan Martell's a great example. He does these founder dinners and founder lunches all over the place. I just was talking to a guy yesterday. Um, it's, it's funny. A lot of people, I've bought my mastermind dinners book yeah. and they're like, I've been doing this exact same thing or whatever. <laughs> so there's a, a lot of the people I know who put a huge emphasis on connecting people yeah. or put a huge emphasis on their network, do some kind of gatherings of sorts, whether it be meetups, dinners, coffees, whatever. Um, we're kind of moving more. We're trying to move more into experiences um, from the dinners because din dinners are great and I still do them all the time. I just did one in Scottsdale last week, which was, which was great. But um, I'm trying to, to move more into actual experiences that puts everybody on a level playing field because you can build deeper connections that way. I do love that you're, you're it's, it's funny. We're at, uh, I think we both know, uh, Scott Oldford. I yeah. was, I was at a dinner with him and we were talking about, I think the topic of the conversation was, uh, marketing funnels, you know, how that's becoming kind of like a big thing for email marketers and just marketers in general. And someone at the table um, was just saying, you know, instead of looking at them as just like email subscribers or email funnels, you're really building a customer experience there. Sure. And and that statement really shifted, you know, the, the whole kind of perspective. It's not just, 
you know, this, you know, whatever, it's not so transactional. It's not just, no, yeah. you know, these, you know, events that people go to, it's not just networking, but it's really the experience that you're bringing them through. And, and so I really love, you know, how, how you just use the word experience there. Um, it's almost like you started like a, a hosting dinner movement. <laughs> like, well, it- there's there's a great saying. Bef- I know we're gonna shift gears, but before we do, I just there's one of my mantras that I always think of. There's a few that I I just live by in business, and one of them is business like life is all about how you make people feel. It's that simple and it's that hard. And that's a quote by Danny Meyer. And that's nice. the one thing. I mean, everything I do business wise, I'm always you know putting myself in the shoes of quote unquote the prospect um, yeah. and say you know if I receive this email, is it is a is it a pain in the ass for me to open this email? Is it like bothersome, <laughs> or is it of high value? Or you know, like what are some touch points we've done? We're, we're pretty well known, I guess, in our space for being thoughtful. Um, you know, for during the events, but then also the lead up for the events. Like we sh- we send knives that have like engravings on them, saying you know, thank you for carving out the time to join us in Napa or whatever the case may be. Um, so I'm always thinking about that customer experience, the entire process. So I never, I don't know, we, we don't do funnels. We don't do, you know, automated <laughs> email sequences or something right, like that, unless right. it's about like somebody signed up for an event and we're giving them information. But um, yeah, I don't look at people as numbers. And that's the one thing too, is that if you look at mastermind talks, we have been incredibly successful with a very small pool of customers, right? We only have 150 people at our events. Right. Um, we don't need... 10,000, 5,000, 1,000, whatever, um, to, to be not only, you know, successful, but very, very, very profitable. So, mm-hmm. um, it's, it's, I, I, I kind of look at it almost from a networking perspective. It's, you know, it doesn't matter how many friends you can count. It matters how many friends you can count on, right? So the quality of those relationships, uh, matters immensely. And the nice thing about Mastermind Talks is every, pretty much everybody who comes to our events is, is a close friend on some level and has yeah. become a close friend. For sure. So uh, that's probably why I put more of an emphasis on, uh, again, the experience than, than most. Mm-hmm. Is the, I, I always find it, um, you know, and, and I agree with you because I, I find it really interesting. I talk to a lot of people that have gone to masterminds or if you research, I actually try to like search up like a negative review of mastermind talks you'll um, never find it no. and, 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 and i couldn't <laughs> actually and you know like i found obviously like tons of your interviews and you know like i you know your book and you know i have a copy you know i found all this great stuff on you guys but i was like wow is it really possible that there's literally no negative re-? and then you know i looked at people in my life that have gone or that you know that are within your network there and you know i was thinking like why why is it that jason you know, is able to, to do this. Like, you know, I'm sure other people have hosted dinners. I'm sure other people have hosted events. Like what is so, you know, special and appealing about it. And I think, you know, it, you kind of touched on it just a little, it's like that extra level of personalization, but not to just like, not like as like a, Oh, I personalized it for you. Like I wrote your name in the top of the email type thing. But like, I feel like you really are a master of like caring for, like people that are in your network and it's almost like that has become like underrated because people are always talking about, you know, marketing funnels and scaling businesses. Um, but yeah, I don't know. It's just, I, no, I kind of just you, no, threw that hit, out there. You hit, hit the nail. I, there, there's, there's a few things why you, I mean, again, I'm not going to say we're flawless and everybody has sure, a, yeah. a 10 out of 10 experience. But, um, one thing is, is that a, we're very specific. We know who our target audience is. We know that we can deliver value to that target audience and anybody who falls outside of that, um, we don't allow to come to our events. Like we don't want them as clients because if we can't, if I can't give somebody a, a hit to steal something from Dan Sullivan, which is, which is like a 10 X experience to some sure, degree yeah, or like a 10 yeah. X in value, um, then I, I, I don't want them because they, they will, you know, they're, they're, you know, if somebody's an aspiring entrepreneur comes to mastermind talks, they may have a great time, but not as much, they won't get the same value as, as if somebody who falls within our, our specific demographic. Mm-hmm. So we're very clear on who that is. And we're, we have, I guess, enough integrity to stay within it and not, not be swayed by money. Cause we have a ton of people who want to come to our events, a ton of people who want to pay more for our events and all that kind of stuff. But we, we know who we can deliver value to. That's who we focus on. And anybody who falls outside of that, we don't care about. Um, that's one thing. And then, um, 
the the second thing which you touched on is is the deep level of caring. I care immensely about the people that come to our events, and it I, I feel like it shows. Um, and my philosophy around like caring and like like that to me like that's the ultimate competitive advantage. Like I can't compete with Ted, you know, with the quality of speakers. I can't right. compete with other events with you know they have better AV. They may have better venues they may have better food i don't like they i'm not going to be the best at everything I, mm -hmm. I just can't be but i can out care ted i can out care uh i don't know who my other competitors are uh summit series <laughs> you know what i mean like sure yeah I, I can and i and that's my only competitive advantage at the end of the day and it's a nice thing because people know our events have not been flawless from like, you know, an AV perspective. Every once in a while, little, you know, slides don't work. <laughs> like, right, right. Our that, last that event we happens. had those issues. But um, there's two things that are the ultimate safety net. One is the quality of people in the room. And and if you have amazing people in the room, you could literally lock the doors for two days, have no talks whatsoever, and people would get, you know, 10 times the value of their investment just to connect with other amazing people. So that's one thing. So that's the ultimate safety net for us. And the second thing is people know I deeply care. So um, it's not, I'm never, nothing bad's ever going to happen because it was like an oversight or just, it was sloppy. Mm -hmm. um, there's technical issues and we're all entrepreneurs. We all understand that. So I think that's an important thing. But um, a common mis mistake that a lot of entrepreneurs make is they want to be everything to everyone. And I think that's when they run into mistakes uh, run into the issue of like people not getting the level of service they, they were hoping for, not getting the desired results they were wanting to achieve and that kind of stuff. So we're very specific. So would, would you say like for a lot of entrepreneurs, like myself included, I think almost every entrepreneur has heard what you just exact, you know, what you said, you can't be everything to everyone. Mm -hmm. But I think like maybe it's the excitement, maybe it's like completely out of fear. But when you just, you know, when you kind of make that conscious shift that, Oh, I'm going to, you know, be an entrepreneur. I'm going to try to, you know, do XYZ business. You, you just say yes to everything. Um, so would you say that first step is to kind of figure out that niche, like figure out, you know, your, per, you know, call it whatever the mission, the purpose, and just have that niche and, and really just try to hone in on, on the target there? Yeah, well, I mean, uh, I'm not a, a huge guy on like mission statements and, and sure. that kind of stuff and getting even business plans because nothing ever goes as planned. I had <laughs> a friend of mine who was a VC who invested in, he's in, based in Ontario and best, invested in 100 plus companies. And we were having lunch one day and he's like, he's like, you know, I never look at business plans. And I'm like, you're a VC investing in companies. Like, why would you never right. look at business plans? And he's like, because, you know, 95% of businesses fail in the first five years and I've never seen a business plan show that a business is going to fail. You know what I mean? Like they always say, I'm going to start making money from day one, right? Yeah, he's like, that's exactly. not the case for 95% of businesses. So he's like, they're, they're, they're just, you know, it's, it's, it's not something to go off of per se. Um, with that said though, uh, Philip McKernan, who I know we just went to his event, uh, a few days ago, he has yeah. a saying, which I think is incredible, uh, which is in a lack of clarity, take action. And, um, you know, for me, when I started, <laughs> I mean, mastermind talks, I could have never dreamed up how mastermind talks is three years ago. Like when we first had our interaction in 2012, yeah. somebody said, Hey, Jason, just to let you know, in three years, you're going to be in the event space. And this is somewhat what it's going to look like. I'll be like, dude, no way. Like that's not, that's not me. That's not what I'm going to be running. These are not the people I'm going to be catering to right. and all that kind of stuff. Um, and if you look at like from the time I thought up Mastermind Talks to the time we actually had our first event, that idea probably pivoted a hundred times easily because we were we didn't know if we wanted to keep something small and be high price point. We didn't know if we wanted to. Um, uh, there, there was just so many different. It was paradox of choice. There was so many options. We were kind of paralyzed. But I knew like if I took action and started being very conscious as to kind of like the lean method. Uh, like lean, lean, lean startup, start, yeah, yeah, lean yeah. startup methodology, where you know you just kind of throw it out there, be uh, and kind of adjust on the fly as need be, based on you know, the response of your audience and all that mm. kind of stuff. Um, that's kind of how we were. That's how we we act. the one. I'll, I'll be one hundred percent transparent. Why we're a price high price point event wasn't designed to be that way because when we first did our our first event, I didn't know how much to charge. I had no clue. So I I reached out to a few friends of mine who put on big events, and. Um, they're like, you know, with the speakers you have, I mean, I had pretty good speakers, but they're like, you know, the most you can get is probably like a thousand bucks a ticket. 
And these guys were charging like 300, 400 bucks for, for their events. Right. And they do huge events with big name speakers. So a thousand bucks for them. They're like, that's, that's a lot of money. Right. It's like triple what they're yeah. looking at. Yeah. So I was like, okay, cool. So I'll charge a thousand bucks. So I started char charging a uh, thousand bucks. And then one day I had an idea. I'm like, I'm just going to start, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send like a hundred people to a landing page where it's $3,000. And I'm just going to see what happens. Um, and at the $3,000 price point, we not only had, uh, the same amount of people sign up at that price point, but they were better quality people, which is what we were looking for all that time. Cause we had an application process and we were trying to weed through people. Mm -hmm. So that's how we became a high price point event. Um, so that was not something we could just sit back and plan. That's something we kind of threw out there and just, you know, it, it worked out and we just yeah. kind of kept on running with it. So, uh, I think that iteration on the fly is, is, is key and you'll have to plan some stuff out in advance, but even getting clarity on who your target audience is, that's something you get clarity on through doing. Um, and now we're very, after three years and, you know, a couple hundred people at our event and, you know, me being in the trenches, now I'm very clear on who our target audience is. Um, but I definitely would not have been this clear when I, out of the gate. So, Taking action is important, and it's easy for me to sit on a pedestal and be like, "Hey, you know, <laughs> yeah, just just go be, out and do it." <laughs> yeah, and don't be everything to everyone and all that kind of stuff. But I, I made that. There's a time where you may have to be, you know, everything to yeah. everyone because you got to make ends meet, sure. um, right? So, but the thing to always keep in mind is 22 immutable laws of marketing is a fantastic book. There's a great saying in there that you you either stand for something in business or you stand for nothing. Um, and that's one thing. There's a lot of events out there and we stand for, for something to a very niche group of individuals. And, you know, we've carved out that niche and we're serving them better than anybody else. And we're totally cool with that. We have no, I have no desire to go against Ted or no desire to go against any other, you know, web right. summit or something like that. Well, you guys so, are kind of the standalone, right? Like mastermind talks has become, you know, the brand on, on its own. I mean, your podcast, your book, everything kind of it rides off the mastermind brand. So I love that you know, you're kind of like a standalone, you know, event and people know you guys for that niche that you provide value for. Yeah, no, we're, we're, we're very lucky. And, and I'd be naive to say there's nobody, we don't have competitors and it's not competitors. The only thing, the, the thing that I guess would be competition is that the people that we target are very busy individuals. So they can only go to so many events or they can only be pulled away from the office so many times a year. So there's a few other events that, or a few other programs that cater to the same type of audience. So we're conscious of that, but I mean, nobody offers a program like we, we do. Um, and not to say it's the best in the world, but for our audience, it is. Right. Uh, so, right. and it's, it's been, <laughs> we've had a few people replicate it with, you know, not the same amount of success. And I think that, again, that comes down to the deep level of caring. Mm -hmm. Out of curiosity, um, by the way, I, I absolutely, you know, I, I'm totally kind of stealing, I don't know where this interview was, you know, I had a set plan, but, you know, at the same time, <laughs> I, I really do value, you know, having a chance to kind of reconnect with you. Um, so just, all of these questions are really just questions that I really wanted to, yeah, yeah, you no know, problem. I was curious for on um, how many, you know, Tim Ferriss has, um, you know, his, his whole thing is always about keeping stakes low, right? So it's not like you just decided you're going to go into the event space um, randomly and, you know, you're going to put all your eggs in one basket per se. Um, Tim says, you know, you should kind of, you know, set up some, some low stakes, almost like practice, you know, instead of, you know, um, let's say you're cooking dinner, uh, for four people, well, don't have the first time that, you know, you're cooking dinner be, you know, right before four people come over, you know, practice a few times um, before the actual kind of event. And I feel like you had a lot of practice with, you know, these uh, mastermind dinners before you actually threw on, you know, the first event and, you know, before all the different pivots. How many dinners did you have prior to the, the big event? Uh, not enough. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh so that's uh so i wish i was a little more prepared um but i i really wasn't i mean we we started our i started dinners in october yeah. the opportunity to do an event with tim happened at the end of november and i ended up um oh, wow. you know making the public announcement that i'm doing the event in february yeah and then uh in may is when it happened so um, I oh God, I, I could probably count the dinners on like one hand it just, just because, and I've done obviously, I don't know, I, don't, I wouldn't say a hundred since then, but I mean, I've, I've done a hell of a lot of, actually not, I've done well over a hundred, uh, dinners since then, but, sure. um, 
it's uh yeah i didn't get all the practice i would have liked and even one great example public speaking i originally was not going to MC the event i was gonna, i was trying to find an MC, but MCs were like five grand ten grand and yeah. um a friend of mine uh his name's michael fishman he runs an event called uh consumer health summit and uh brilliant guy and he said you know what he's like if you're you know your events are all about like authenticity and all that kind of stuff and you have somebody who's a polished MC, it's not gonna it's not in alignment with the the event um, so he's like, why don't you speak? And I'm like, dude, I don't, I don't speak. I've never spoken on a stage before or anything like that. Um, but I decided to, to do it. I decided to be the MC and it was terrifying. Absolutely terrifying. Right. <laughs> like, that was the largest audience I ever spoken in front of. And on top of that, it was filled with like my, my mentors that I, you know, would look up to like guys like Tim Ferriss and Mark Echo and Danny Reese from Canada Goose and Bruce Boone Tip from G Adventures and like all these guys are there and I'm like this is the first time I'm like ever public speaking and I'm scared <laughs> crapless so yeah it's it's one of those things like I wish I was more prepared but there's also I think we have we don't tap into our full capabilities either mm -hmm. I, I feel like sometimes like I, I totally understand like you know Tim's philosophy around keeping the stakes low but the reason I did the whole you know, I to get Tim, I actually so I knew Tim, but I bought four thousand books to get him to speak to two of my events. That was um, when he was launching uh for our chef. For our chef, right? Yeah. Um so that was a hell of a Hail Mary for me because I was a, a you know, quarter million dollars in debt. And I never even included until recently that I actually wasn't a quarter million dollars in debt. I was three hundred and thirty four thousand dollars in debt because I bought those, you know, four thousand <laughs> oh books. My God. Um so, uh, but it, it was one thing that when that opportunity came my way, when I looked back at my ticketing business, the reason we grew so quickly was because I always threw these Hail Marys that forced me to find a way to make things work. So I'd always, I'd buy, you know, half a million dollars of tickets on a credit card, knowing that I didn't have money in the bank account, but I'd have to find half a million dollars or make half a million dollars in sales that month to pay that credit card off so I could right. use that card again, right? So I always kind of stretched myself. And um, uh, in, when that, that Tim Ferriss opportunity came up, I, I did that again. And, and that's that's one reason why we've grown so quickly is that, you know, I constantly kind of stretch myself. And it's not, uh, I, I, some people make the mistake of thinking entrepreneurs are risk takers. Sure. Uh, but there's, we take calculated risk you know what i mean like it's it's very the whole eighty four thousand dollar thing and buying the four thousand books sounds crazy and it was but i did have you know there's a mental framework which is like if this then that right so yeah. if i get the four thousand books and i can't use them for an event then i'll sell the you know four thousand books to somebody else in the event space like i already had these kind of mental models set up so i think that's a common misconception about entrepreneurs is that they they take these enormous risk um but it's usually they take, you know, risk of their, they're very minimal, but they have huge upsides. For sure. Jason, I, I think, I mean, I know everyone tells you all the time, but I really do think the, the story is absolutely fascinating. Um, I do want to switch gears just a little bit. Sure. Um, I know uh, I'm in your MMT community on, on Facebook there. Sure. Um, and uh, I know you give out these like playing cards, I think for people that uh, um, just so like icebreakers. Yes, uh, right. Yep. Like icebreaker yep. questions. Yep. So I, I was just looking through them earlier, and I had a couple <laughs> ones. Just wanted to pick them off and, and ask you because I, th I I mean it's like a four or five page like of just like questions. Sure. Yeah. Um, so uh, so here's one: If you had to move and could only take three things with you, uh, what would they be? Um, so granted, my my wife and my daughter are already coming with me. Um, well, uh, I'd say. Three things would be um, my wallet, because uh, then I could buy a laptop <laughs> or anything else I need. Uh, that's what, like when I travel, I need my wallet and my passport, uh, and then everything else I can buy. That's my philosophy. So if like I forget socks or anything, I'm like I'll yeah. buy socks. Yeah, exactly. um, so my wallet, my passport, so I could travel, uh, and then also this book that my wife actually made me for my 30th birthday, which was uh, it was. Um, basically a collection of gratitude letters from friends and, and people from mastermind talks and stuff like that, uh, which was really, yeah, I, I, it, it was amazing. So I had letters from like Ryan holiday in there, Seth Godin, all these people, wow. and there's what, 70, 75 letters that she compiled into this beautiful book. Um, and they're just all these, you know, kind of notes of gratitude. And it's, it's funny because 
um, <laughs> one of my things when I was like younger was that like the true measures of true measure of somebody's life was how many people show show up to their funeral. And, um, it's, it, it was just, it was great to get acknowledged on certain things. Um, and, uh, but the funny thing is as well is that when I got the book, I also realized I didn't need that outside validation as much as I used to. Mm-hmm. So it was a great reminder or it showed me like how much I've grown. So it was a, a beautiful gesture. And like I said, I, I want to keep that book for the rest of my life. But it also was a moment where I realized that the outside validation I was seeking for so long, you know, always worrying about what people are going to think or what my parents are going to think and keeping everybody happy didn't matter as much anymore because I, you know, I was fulfilled. I kind of have learned to kind of fulfill myself and, and, you know, just be happy, you know, in my own skin and all that kind of stuff. So, um, those would be the three things. For sure. Wow. That's, uh, that was, a uh, that's an amazing gift from, from your wife. Really thoughtful. Yeah, it was fantastic. Um, if you could, I, I know you mentioned you've had like over a hundred dinners, so I'm sure this question has for sure come up. Um, if you can invite three people <laughs> living or dead, um, to your home for dinner, um, uh, I don't know if you're going to be cooking or your wife, but <laughs> who would they be and, and why? It's so, yeah, it's so funny that, uh, these are getting thrown back at me. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, oh God, there's a, God, there's so many, um, I think uh, Will Smith is somebody who, from just just understanding his like personal journey and and watching and coming across a lot of his like motivational uh, videos and stuff like that of like excerpts of his, his interviews. Um, I just think he has like a phenomenal just mindset um, and way of looking at life, and probably in turn is is an incredible father. Um, so he would be somebody I'd, I'd really be interested in, in sitting down with. Um, hmm. uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger would be another, uh, I mean, talk, his, his story is absolutely incredible. I mean, it's, to, it's crazy to, yeah, to come to the States, not knowing the language, becoming a millionaire in real estate, then venturing off into, uh, movies and not compromising, you know, taking like crappy roles or anything like that he really kind of built his career on his terms which you know back back then movies didn't want big muscly guys as actors right uh, or guys then, with maybe an accent yeah too, yeah. 100, yeah and and everybody was suggesting you should take like speech linguistic classes classes to like remove that accent and then you know kept on persevering then got into politics which is like such a like a left turn and then married a kennedy and all this kind of stuff so it's uh yeah, dude. I mean, that guy, you talk about like perseverance. I mean, the guy is just an example of that. So just an incredible man on that front. Um, and then, oh God, I, just, I don't know. Uh, it's weird because I'm like, I'm, there's so many friends I'd want to have. And then celebrity wise, I have no, I don't have a ton of desire to connect to big celebrities anymore. Um, I'm trying to think of a book I read recently that may be great. I'm looking at my bookshelf. This this answer always kind of changes. Victor Frankel could would be a great one as well. Yeah, uh, um, okay. he wrote a book called Man's Search for Meaning. He was a psych, psych- psychologist or psychiatrist, but anyways, he was in the uh, concentration camps um, of World War II, and basically uh, wrote this beautiful book about how those who survived, like the mindset they had yeah. during their their time in the concentration camps, um, and it was just a really really powerful book. So. I mean, beyond that, I have maybe 150 friends that I want to have at, at tables around me if we're doing this in a restaurant. But those would be three great people. No, those are absolutely amazing. On the note of uh, Arnold, I remember, I, I think I was listening to Total Recall, his his bio, his bio, biography yeah, on uh, on audio. And just like the the belief that that guy had, just 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 going for it, not just like blindly, but just he just really had that courage and that just a belief, just listening to the stories going through. Yeah, he was an amazing story. Um, on the topic of books, um, I actually haven't read the, the one that you just mentioned, but what are some favorite books that you've at least read two to three times? Like the, the Bibles that you kind of, you know, pick up every now and then. Uh, so man search for meaning. I'm looking at my bookshelf right now. So man search for <laughs> meaning is, is definitely one. Yeah. Um, uh, 22 Immutable Laws of Marketing. Both are small, quick reads. Um, <laughs> God, there's a lot I revisit. Uh, 
I mean, one I'm reading right now is uh, the Social Animal. Um, what's what's that? I haven't. It's it's. I, I, well, hold on. Let me make sure it's it's. That's actually <laughs> the name of it. Uh, it is. Yeah. Hold on. Social. Yeah, the Social Animal. Um, it's man, that's an incredible book, and that one is a book I'll be rereading for sure. Um, it's basically about. He takes there's like a, this like third person narrative uh, throughout the entire book, which is really unique for a, a type of book like this. But it really just talks about like unconsciously, you know how how we we decide on things like you know who we decide to date and all that kind of stuff. And um, like it's not like the the stuff you normally think. It's based a ton on research. Uh, it's just a super fascinating book. Uh, so it's called yeah, Social Animal. There's another great book I read called Man's uh, not Man's Search for Me, um, The Way of the Superior Man. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, I almost highlighted that entire book. Uh, <laughs> it was, uh, yeah, that was an amazing book, and you know, even Tim Ferriss's Four Hour Work Week, I revisit from time to time because there's yeah. always something in there. Like it's, there's um, a great saying that the eyes are the the eyes can read what the mind is ready to comprehend, or something like that. Right. So I find like good books, if you reread them at different parts of your life, you'll get something different from it every time. Huh. Um, so Four Hour Work Week, I mean, that was. I read that back in 2009, 2008, 2009. Um, and that was probably one of the most impactful books at, at that point in time. But it's a book I've revisited on, on several occasions and uh, always been impactful. And Unlimited Power, Tony Robbins. I got a ton of books. So, um, <laughs> yeah, I, I love, uh, I, I love, uh, I love, yeah, reading and education and all that kind of it, stuff. It, it's almost like that saying, um, the, like whenever you're ready, the teacher will will appear. Hundred percent. I'm totally paraphrasing, but um, no, those are. I feel like four hour work week is is one that uh, a lot of entrepreneurs kind of revisit. Whether you want to, I mean, you actually achieve, you know, at some level that that lifestyle, um, and uh, it's such a great reference for so many people. Um, last question for you. Uh, we're, you know, the, the show is called the inner change maker. And I always ask everyone at the end of the show, what do, what do they think of when they hear the word change maker? Because we, I say it on the show all the time. It's people, you know, I'm trying to get purpose driven entrepreneurs, people that are not necessarily kind of focused on just making a million dollars, but impacting a million people. And maybe that should be kind of a new definition of a millionaire. So curious to see what, what you would say um, or what comes to mind with the word change maker. Um, change maker. I don't know. Rumi has a, a great quote, which is yesterday I was clever. So I wanted to change the world. Uh, today I am wise. So I'm changing myself. And I think, I don't know. I've been on a personal development journey since I was like 18. And the more I get into it, and the deeper I dive into it, the more I realize like how important that that self work is sure. before you start to um, you know change the world for others and stuff like that. Right. So it's um, that's yeah that's my kind of personal kind of philosophy. Um, but it's uh, yeah, I mean, change maker would be somebody like who would challenge the the status quo. I don't. I mean, some would consider me you know a change maker in my small space uh, to some degree because we're. I'm a firm believer that conventional methods yield conventional results. So we do things very differently than, than other people. And, um, one could say that because when we, we ventured off into this like new formats for our events and all that kind of stuff, a lot of people have tried to replicate it since. Um, mm -hmm. but, uh, yeah, I mean, I, the first thing that came to mind is, is the importance of, of self work. Um, you know, again, personal growth and always working on yourself and, and that kind of stuff. Cause, uh, you know, the, these unconscious drivers that we have show up in our businesses all the time and we don't even remotely realize it. And the more I get to know entrepreneurs, high level entrepreneurs at a deep level, yeah. um, the more I just, this gets confirmed over and over again. So, um, I think it's that, that journey of, of just understanding, but that journey of, of, you know, self-awareness is, is really important. That's awesome, man. Um, well, why don't, you know, I know people could follow you for the podcast. They should definitely, you know, go and um, download or, or buy your book. Um, where else could, or where can people kind of keep in touch with um, yourself or Mastermind Talks um, and just kind of, you know, follow you on, on the next three years and hopefully many more years to come uh, on your journey? 
Yeah. So, I mean, um, yeah, the book is, is mastermind dinners and it's not really just about dinners. It's, it's, it's kind of my, I guess my philosophy on relationship building, um, and stuff like that. So that book has been going, uh, really well. And you can, I, I realized recently that the book is, is you can find it for free on like torrent oh, sites. Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> if you Google like mastermind dinners torrent or something like that, and, and you don't want to spend the whatever three ninety nine, feel free to grab the book for free. Um, so, uh, you could do that. Oh also a hack. I'll give you a hack. If you go to masterminddinners.com and put in your email address, yeah. um, you'll get uh, exclusive resources. You'll get the, uh, the uh, audio book version. So um, there you go. I'm cannibalizing my sales. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, check out the book. Uh, I'm on uh, my Twitter is, is my name, which is at Jason Gaynard, J-A-Y-S-O-N-G-A-I-G-N-A-R-D. But uh, yeah, I'm not too hard to find. For sure. Jason, this has been super fascinating and, and I think it's been really educational actually from um, you know, a relationship building perspective. And for a lot of the young entrepreneurs, aspiring entrepreneurs listening, um, thank you. Thank you again for, for your time and, and for being on the show. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll have to do this again, I'm sure, at some point. I'm open to it, man. Yeah. Just let me know. Hey, I'm just going to jump in here really quick before everything ends. I hope you guys enjoyed that episode. I mean, looking back on that story, it is just so epic. And, um, you know, it doesn't work out with everyone like this, but uh, just, you know, figuring out his thinking and and the way that he bets on relationships, the way that he structured his events, you know, it's no surprise to see that uh, Jason is kind of at the top of his game right now. So um, I hope you guys, you know, learned a lot from listening to that episode Uh, in the spirit of serving you guys. um, Also, please feel free to email or reach out to me via Twitter um, or email. There's been a lot of reposting going on via Instagram as well. Um, Instagram is just my name, J Wong, J Wong. Um, the reason I'm doing this is because I want to make the show less about me and more about you, the listener. And so if you guys have suggestions on formatting or on topics or on future guests, I would love to try to incorporate that for you if it aligns with the purpose of the show. So um, feel free to reach out to me there, Twitter, Instagram, email, whatever works for you. Send me a carrier pigeon if you could track down my address. I don't think it's too hard. So until later this week, live with passion, live your dream, and live it now.